Well, good morning. Welcome to Alpha Baptist Church on this beautiful Resurrection Sunday. We thank you for coming to celebrate with us the rising of our Lord and Savior. Uh, for those of you who may not know me, I'm Pastor Richard Alston. I'm the uh, fourth string wild lefty. Um, so buckle up for a good time. Before we start, I do want to say thanks to our pastoral staff. For uh, As a pastor, it's always an honor to preach on Resurrection Sunday. As many of you know, this is probably the most popular day uh, for churches next to Christmas. Uh, so I'm honored that they trust me to bring the message today, and I hope it's one uh, that you're willing to listen to. Now, this week for me was especially challenging, and I'm, I'm not a conspiracy theorist at heart, uh, but I found it quite interesting that those of you that know me know I already live a busy and hectic lifestyle. My wife prefers to refer to it as I'm the creator of my own pain. <clears throat> I completely disagree with that assertion. But this week was even more challenging than normal. It really prevented me from being able to prepare as I had desired. And I couldn't help but think about the fact that the system hates this church because we will always preach the gospel. Because today is the day where we celebrate the resurrection. This is the most wonderful day in the Christian calendar. Christmas always gets the glory, but really it's about today. It's all about today. And that's why this sermon series is going to be focused on the resurrection. We're going to be in 1 Corinthians 15 for the entire time. So let's get started. Now last week we really focused on the purpose, why it occurred. And we learned that our God is a God of grace. And our God is just not a God of grace in terms of salvation, but He's a God of grace in terms of revelation. You see, we're not in a system, we're not in a life where we have to look to some Mount Olympus, some nine realms of Asgard, some, some Egyptian hieroglyphics on our lost golden plates. No, we have facts God has provided us with revelation, with light, tangible light, that if we will respond to, He will bring us the truth of His Son. But we have to respond to that light. It's, it's so amazing that our God gave us evidence. Jesus Himself, when He was about to be stoned in uh, John 10 in the 30s in those verses, where they wanted to stone Him for blasphemy, He responded by saying, if you do not believe Me, believe the works that I have done. You see, God does not leave us without evidence that we can examine. The question is, are we willing to examine the evidence? So we talked about the purpose, why it occurred. Today, we're going to move on to the place where it occurred. Last week, we learned the why, which was to glorify our God by granting verifiable testimony to all and grace for believing humanity. Now, as we go along in this sermon series, I'm going to continue to build on concepts that I have discussed in the previous week. So if there's something that I breeze through, just recognize the fact that it may have been discussed in a previous service. I invite you to go back to our website. Uh, we have amazing people who built this incredible, magical website, and you can watch these things in the past. Now today I'm going to do a little different style than I normally do. I'm going to go verse by verse, and I extract points that I feel are relevant to the topic I want to address today. Now, in doing this, I promise you, those who are students of the Bible are going to say, hey, we didn't talk about this, you didn't talk about the Greek construction of this word, and you didn't cross-reference this verse to this. Like, I know you're going to do that, because I used to do that. When I was a seminary student, right, when I was doing that of my own accord, one of my favorite things to do was listen to a pastor and tell my wife all the things the pastor could have done better. <laughs> Loved it. It was so much fun. So now that I've had the blessing of being able to get here and to present, I've learned that there is a, a definitive art to holding a study class and presenting digestible information and trying to inspire you. A pastor should just be the gravy to your biscuits. I should be the ketchup to your fries, right? <laughs> if you're one of those weird people in the Northeast or Canada, right, that do vinegar and fries or whatever that, that nonsense is, right? Look. I can only add to what you're doing. I cannot be the meat. I cannot be the sustenance. No pastor can. 
right? You've got to dig into the Word yourself. And again, that's the beauty of our God. He's so gracious. It's here. Like, you don't need to learn from me who is flawed, faulty, got all kinds of issues. You can learn from the God of the universe all you want to know. Your own. You don't need a church anybody. Now, we're here to help you. I'm not saying don't go to church. I'm just saying this is here for you if you're willing to do the work. Proverbs 2 talks about it. This is filled with treasure. But by definition, where do you find treasure? Right? Do you just go in your backyard and find treasure? Do you you just wander down? No, you have to mine for treasure. You have to work for treasure. If you want the treasures of wisdom that is in this book, you must do the work. I cannot do it for you. I am just the gravy to your biscuits. Those of you from the South know exactly what I'm talking about. All right, if you join me today, we're going to be starting out in 1 Corinthians 15. Uh, if you're new to the Bible, if you want to cut it about a quarter away from the back, you'll probably land in the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John. And then you go backward, Acts, Romans, and you'll find yourself 1 Corinthians will be in the 15th chapter. Today we're going to be looking about, or correction, we're going to look at the question of where. Where did the resurrection take place? Now, obviously, we knew the, the place on Calvary, but we're going to be looking at this at a little bit of a deeper level. The resurrection took place at a specific time in a chosen place to the Messiah. For those of you who are filling in your notes, that's what you need to fill in. Now, if you're there with me on 1 Corinthians 15, verses 12 is where we'll start. Now, if Christ has preached that he has been raised from the dead... How do some among you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? But if if there is no resurrection of the dead, then Christ is not risen. And if Christ is not risen, then our preaching is empty and your faith is also empty. Yes, and we are found false witnesses of God because we have testified of God that he has raised up Christ, whom he did not raise up. If in fact the dead do not rise, for if the dead do not rise, then Christ is not risen. And if Christ is not risen, your faith is futile. You are still in your sins. Then also those who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men the most pitiful. Pitiful. Ugh. Good luck with that one. You know how to read it. First Corinthians 15, 12 through 19. All right. Before we start, hallelujah. Today is the day he has risen. If you walk out with nothing else, This is a day of celebration. He is risen. He is risen indeed. Celebrate this day. This is the greatest day on our calendar. Celebrate this fact. He is alive, therefore we are spiritually alive from now until forever. Resurrection Sunday. Now again, I'm going to go through this verse by verse because there are certain points I want to try to extract for you that are relevant to my message today. Now, again, the challenge is, in this particular passage, the Apostle Paul is being hypothetical. In other words, he is presenting a situation that is false to try to extract a lesson for you. We, we all do this commonplace, right? I mean, um, I cannot imagine how dysfunctional my life would be without my wife, right? That is a hypothetical examination. If I did not have my wife, my life would literally be a mess as it is right now. Now, before I met my wife, I'd be living in a cabin on a motorcycle because it's a different story. But now that she's in my life, if I didn't have her, it'd be a mess. So as I go through these and I extract these points, we can't forget this aspect. This is a passage that is being hypothetical. Paul is not saying that the resurrection didn't happen. He's just saying and trying to elevate the fact that if it didn't happen, that we of all people are the worst off. You see here, he says, if Christ is preached. We don't just have a duty to preach. And that's not just me as an officer pastor, right? I I am not the only pastor. Like, well, we're one of the only pastors, but everybody has the function of preaching. If you think of your obligation to preach as a duty, you've got the wrong perspective. The fact that we can preach is an honor. I mean, honestly, think about it. The God who created this universe with his mere words, 
the God who is willing to live a life crucified and died for us, the God of infinite value has chosen you to take the greatest message this world will ever hear, which is God loves you, God wants you to come home, simply accept what he has done, and you will be forever forgiven. What greater message, what greater honor is there? It is not an obligation to preach. It is an honor. And it's not just that it's an honor. A lot of us right now, it's, it's easy to get weighed down by the darkness of this world. I was talking to a friend of mine who's recently been hired by the airlines and starting to, to work uh, on the line as a pilot. And he comes, we, we were talking the other day, and he was saying, Rich, I cannot believe how dark this world is. My company is woke. I'm just surrounded by news. This world is so dark. But you know what the good news of that is? How bright is your light? Right? I don't know about you personally, but me personally, I want to live in a tough time. I want to finish my life and know that I lived in tough times. I want to know that I was a light. No amount of darkness can dispel your light. Right? The darker this society is, the more light we can share. It's a, it's a beautiful thing. It's beautiful. Don't look at it in the negative. Look at it as the positive, right? This world is miserable. Great. I can show them joy. This is such a great opportunity to share the light with the world. Now, moving on to verse, a little further down the verse, you see here he says, he has been raised from the dead again. We aren't preaching ideas or mythology or, or self-help nonsense in Christianity. We are preaching fact, truth, God's revelation. Yeah, I mentioned earlier John 10. God has said himself, Jesus said himself, if you don't believe me, believe the works I do. We have a God who's so gracious, who has provided us with revelation. We can verify this for ourselves if you're just willing to do the work. So when you're witnessing and you're challenged, don't put the burden on yourself to have all the answers. Now, I talk about this in my apologetics class. The burden is not on your shoulders. Your burden is to be a witness, to give the truth. And if you get challenged, don't feel defeated. Just simply say, you know what? I guarantee I can find the answer for that because God is not scared of truth don't believe the society that wants you to feel that you need to go hide in a cave avoid science avoid philosophy avoid engagement with the culture like we're scared of truth God is not scared of truth but you're not an individual we're here as a corporate church so when you go out and you struggle and you're witnessing guess what you can do right you can come back and get a gentleman like Bob. Bob isn't scared of anybody. Oh, well, okay, scared of crack. Moving on here, verse 13. If there is no rest of the dead, then Christ is not risen. I want to spend six sermons on the topic of resurrection because it is the very foundation of our faith. If you as a Christian don't walk out powerful with the knowledge and the belief of the resurrection, then what are you doing? What can you do? You can't be effective. This is the bedrock of everything. And this is Paul's entire point is hypothetical passage is if the resurrection is not true, then we have no point that is absolutely pointless to be a Christian if the resurrection isn't true. This is the bedrock of what we believe. Again, I can only be the gravy to your biscuits. I, I would recommend Gary Habermas, H-A-B-E-R-M-A-S, if you want to know more historical, more documented evidence on the, the objective truth and the historicity of the crucifixion. I recommend you go do him. I can only be the gravy to your biscuits. Please do your own work. Anytime you hear a pastor say something, do the work. We must be strong. We must be adamant. We must, must be passionate about the resurrection. Right? That is, that is why every, that's why it's the cross. Right? That's why I'm not a, I mean, I'm not a fan of, what's the word I'm looking for? You know, we should be looking forward to Revelation 19, Christ returning in the clouds 
with the army. That's my personal opinion. That's the next event on our timeline. The cross is where we got. I'm not a fan of, of images that put Christ on the cross because he's not there anymore. That's my own personal take. I'm not saying you're wrong again, just like Easter. I'm not saying it's wrong. I'm just saying you can be so much more powerful if you just be a little bit more deliberate with what we're doing. Resurrection Sunday. You mean Easter? No, I mean Resurrection Sunday because there are no Easter bunnies. You know, one of the traditions that I've gotten away from because I haven't been able to do falconry in a couple years is we used to always eat rabbit on Sunday. We can tell my kids we don't believe in the Easter bunny. It's a wonderful tradition. I would also recommend you to have venison on New Year's Eve because you don't believe in the reindeer thingers. The... All right, verse 14. <clears throat> Paul mentions here about preaching being empty. If our preaching is not based on fact, God's revelation, it is pointly and empty. I'm just a, a windbag making noise. And this is why I personally get so passionate about the doctrine of creation. Because the theory of evolution produces atheists. Without a doubt. You can, you can read up on uh, Dawkins. says It's exactly what Dawkins claims to be. And he's probably the most ardent evolutionist there is out there. Listen, we have to stand strong on the truths that are revealed in the Bible. Why is the doctrine of creation so vital? It's so vital because it's, it's reality. Look, don't believe the world when it says Christianity is opposed to science or Christianity, hey, say, look, you might, I can't go into this deeper, but I just want to give you terms to do in your research. There's a definitive difference between operational science, which is what you see today, which is how your iPhone works, how quantum physics works, how medicine works. All this is operational science. What they try to make a big deal about is what you, is referred to, it's an oxymoron, which is two contradictory things, which will be historical science, which is things that have not been observed that they are trying to make scientific assertions about. You cannot. The very definition of science is what? Who, who can tell me? Is observation. So if you can't observe it, you can't have science. So... There is nothing about an iPhone that depends on the theory of evolution. There's nothing in medicine. There's nothing in biomechanics. There's nothing that depends on theory of evolution. It is a pipe dream, and it's made up by people who want to oppose God. Because here's reality. You look out and you see this world is so beyond. I mean, think about your body. Now, I'm going to step out of here a little. Our body reproduces itself, not entirely, but for the most part, our cells are reproducing. In essence, we are are living in a different material self in every decade or something like that. Like, there's a few parts that's not exact, but to an essence. Do we understand that? Right? You can't even buy a car that will work for 10 years. <laughs> and you're telling me that we evolved from nothing? That literally makes no logical sense whatsoever. When God revealed himself to the nation of Israel, when Moses said, how, what is it, Lord, you want me to say to them? What did he say? I am. What does that mean? There's so much more to that. It means that he is the only thing that is uncreated. You see, if you're logical about this, you only have one alternative. There's either an infinite universe or there's an infinite God. There's the only two options. Think about it. Right now, this is not true, but theory of evolution says there was a big bang. It created a solar system that created rocks. It created a rock with a sun that could create life, which created life, which evolved. Right. This caused this. Well, what caused the Big Bang? Okay. Well, then, okay. What caused that? The cause of the Big Bang. What is the multiverse? Okay. What Spider-Man in the multiverse created the Big Bang and created that? Well, it was the, the bad Spider-Man. Oh, what? Do you see what I'm saying? You cannot keep to have this infinite regression of causes. At some point, the buck had to stop somewhere. And that is why God said, I am. There's no more powerful statement in two words than that simple phrase, I am. I am. He always has, he always will, and he always is. He is the only infinite. We are not preaching an empty faith. We are preaching reality and faith. And people just need to open their eyes and answer to the light that God gives everybody. But the greatest thing that our society does is distract people. I 
That's my beautiful wife. But this thing is a smartphone, and it's smarter than you if you let it, right? This can be a wonderful tool. There's so many good things that this tool can do for you. But if you let it enslave you by owning all your time, owning all your attention, right? You are no longer it, its master. You are now its tool. That's in everything. That is, that is always the challenge, is that humanity can abuse everything. We abuse sex. We abuse family. Uh, we abuse relationships. We abuse each other. And because of that, they try to say, well, it must be bad. Well, no, we're not doing it by God's way. When you disobey God, then you will reap the consequences of that disobedience. Now, if our preaching is empty, then your faith is empty. I'll give a plug here for Alpha Baptist. Hey, I know we're not everybody's flavor. Got it? Everybody can't deal with my sweet suits I bring? I got it. But wherever you decide to go, wherever you decide to plant, commit, and go to a church where they preach the Bible. Again, it's not always going to be motivating. It's not always going to be good. You're going to have a, it's, it's fine. But go somewhere, plant, commit, be part of the body of Christ, be Christ-like by serving and sacrificing, start in the nursery. <laughs> that won't be my last plug for the nursery. All right, verse 15. You see, it refers to if there's no resurrection and we're preaching Christianity, we are false witnesses. And God says himself in the ninth commandment, it's one of the commandments, not be a false witness. In Proverbs 6, we know this, one of the abominations, it's one of the things that God hates as a false witness. And I can tell you as a law enforcement officer, there's nothing more aggravating or useless than a false witness. And we all know from life, right? Why? Why is being a false witness so evil? Because it rejects truth, right? There's nothing more important in life than truth, and God is truth. Now, I'm going to flesh this out a little bit more. Uh, I won't get to during this sermon. But we obviously don't want to be false witnesses, right? Right? And we don't just want to limit ourselves to being a witness. Being a witness is like, I was saved. This is how you can be saved. This is how God changed my life. That is, that is being a witness, which we're all called to be. But I want us to be expert witnesses. I want the people in Athel Baptist, our members, our believers, go out and be expert witnesses. And when you're an expert witness, you can take the Bible and you can answer what I refer to as the six greatest life questions to another person. You can tell them what has the greatest value, which is truth. Who did I come from, which is God. Why am I here to glorify God? How should I live? It's in the Bible. When will Christ return? It's imminent. And where am I going? It depends on what you do with Christ. All of that can be found in the Bible if you will study it and mine its treasures and know it. But I can't do it. I can't do it for you. I can't in 45. I mean, my apologetics class, I'm sure is about to pull the hair out with the, the uh, eight people I have remaining, right? <laughs> Because it's tough stuff. Like, you know, I try not to get emotional here. I have a brother who's not in faith. And I would give every, I would give so much for him to believe, but I can't, it's not possible. And I can't do the work for you. No pastor can do the work for you. And it's there. It's, you know, I was part of a homeschool community. And one of the things I used to say, because people would come in, and they'd be like, hey, we want to join your homeschool. You know, I've got a three-year-old. I've got him listening to Mozart. I've already got him in organic chemistry. And, uh, you know, I'm pretty sure he's going to Stanford. I'm like, okay, that's wonderful. But I'll say, you know what the, mag what the wonderful thing about homeschool is community. But you're never going to believe me until you do it. Just like I'm telling you, the wonderful part about church is serving. But you're never going to believe me or any pastor until you do it, until you serve and God will give you the joy. He will give you the peace. So when you're changing that diaper back there, although I don't even know if that's allowed with nursery, but whatever the nursery does, fundamental, right? Until you do it, you'll never believe. 
Just like a, a change in your lifestyle. You've got to do it. You've, it's here. You can learn from God himself if you will do the work. The horse is prepared for the day of battle, but victory belongs to the Lord. Proverbs 21, 31. The emphasis of that verse is this. God will have the victory, but you've got to do the work. Anybody who's ever dealt with horses, right? It's not, not like a dirt bike you can jump on and you know exactly what's going to go, right? A horse, never know where it's getting on that day, especially if you've got a mare. All right, moving on. Christ is referred to here sometimes. Now, again, I have a style that I like to use. Just like with Resurrection Sunday, I also personally try to avoid saying Jesus Christ. My preference is to say Jesus the Christ. And this is why. Jesus Christ is not, it's not his last name. It's not his name. Christ is a title. It is the Greek for the Hebrew Messiah who is the consecrated, the anointed one to be our priest, our prophet, and our king. And how many times, this is another personal style, I, I recommend you try this. When you hear someone take the Lord's name in vain, when they say, Jesus Christ, I will always say, is Lord. And I've had people just look at me like, what just happened? I'm like, you heard what happened. What's the question? Right? So when people take the... Lord's name in vain, and they say that, follow it up with, is Lord. And you don't have to be confrontational about it. Just, just try it out. I'm going to take your slur, and I'm going to turn it into a praise. So again, my personal style is I prefer to say Jesus the Christ, because I want to highlight the fact that Christ is a title. It's our King, our Messiah. It's not his last name. And he's our king and our Messiah because of what he has done on the Christ and what we celebrate today, the fact that he has resurrected. See here, Paul hypothetically talks about our faith being futile if the resurrection, and that's true, if there's no resurrection, this is pointless. We are wasting our time literally right now. Like you should be fishing or watching, is it basketball or football? I don't know, whatever, what are sports going right now? Or spending 14 hours at a wrestling tournament like I did yesterday. Anyway. Hey, but God is alive. Our faith is alive. Our church is alive. Hallelujah. We don't have a futile faith. We have an alive faith. And, and you should just be effervescent. I know some of you who only interact with me in this stage where I'm on the stage and you're there, you may think I'm a bubbly personality. You may think I'm, I'm an uh, extrovert is not the case. I am very private, very introverted, and again, I'd like to be in a cabin with about four motorcycles, but that's beside the point. <laughs> Look, let this faith drive you. Let yourself be powerful about this news. One of the things I was most thankful for with the law, short law enforcement career I had was it got me to the point where I was comfortable having awkward conversations. Sir, you're wearing a nightie and you're peeing on a tree. <laughs> Downtown. Right? You just get used to awkward conversation in law enforcement. It's just like what you do for 12 hours a day. I know everybody doesn't have that, but I'm telling you, don't let the fear of awkwardness, embarrassment, shame, uh, whatever, prevent you from engaging with people. Right now, I guarantee we have people who've come here that don't normally attend this church. If you attend this church, again, I'm saying this, and, and I'm, I'm, being, I'm exaggerating, but I'm not. They need to be mauled. They need to be mauled with our love our kindness, our hugs, our just questions of who they are, why are you here, right? Please, do not let us be a church who allows a single person to come through here and not leave here being like, wow, that was the most awkward experience I've ever had. <laughs> right? We're all weird. 
We're all a problem. Like, get over yourself and engage with somebody. Please. People don't walk through this door if they're not desiring connection in some way. Now, I understand there's some, some people that get drug here. I got it. Well, not drugged here. Okay. Let's, let's use a better term. People that are coerced into coming. Oh, I oh, love the peanut gallery. All right, let's move on to the next one. Those who have fallen asleep. Hey, one of the most wonderful aspects of our Christian heritage is you have a chance to leave a legacy. You know, I'm so excited to go to heaven so I can see my opa. He was a man who, who just left a love of God, love, a love of Christ, and just, just a power of talking about Christ that I hope that I carry on. My own father, who just gave me the example of a man who gave all to his family, who served, who sacrificed, who was not a, a flamboyant personality, but would do anything to raise a man who would survive in this world. And he left me too soon, but I'm, I'm so excited to see him again. And that is the wonderful thing about Christianity is we will be reunited with our loved ones one day. We have a legacy. Now, obviously, Christ is using, or excuse me, the Apostle Paul is using the metaphor of falling asleep here for death. We will be reunited one day. Such a wonderful aspect of Christianity. And everybody can join, everybody can be part of that legacy. So just think, when you decide to be part of the nursery, how many little kids are going to be excited to see you one day? Think about it. You have all these little kids who are going to be growing up. You'll think they've forgotten you, and you come through heaven's doors, and be so excited to see you, that nursery worker who used to sing to them or dance. or In this life only, we have a single life. Hebrews is definitive on this point. You know, you used to say, you only are assured... Death and taxes. Well, half this company doesn't have to worry, half this country doesn't have to worry about taxes, right? But we all have to worry about death. Death is inevitable. And here's the terrifying part of life. God will give you your will if you will not take his will. God's will, 2 Timothy 2:14. He desires all men to be saved. John 3, 16, for whosoever, right? We know what God's will is. God wants everybody to come home. There's nothing you've done. There's nothing you will do. There's nothing you've said. There's nothing that will prevent you from coming back to God but yourself. That's it. And what's terrifying is that if you stand before God on that final day, and you have lived a life that says, you know what, I do not want anything to do with you, God. On that day, he will grant you your wish. He will say, I never knew you. Depart from me. Please do not spend this life refusing God. He loves you so much. If you don't know how much he loves you, that's why we have the cross. It is a reminder of how much God loves you. He died for you. Now, I want to end with some application. And I'm going to break this application down in about three parts. We're going to celebrate our risen Lord. That is the fundamental honor of this day. It's to celebrate our risen Lord. Now, we're going to celebrate by letting people know about the gospel. Like the gospel and the resurrection are intertwined. They, they, you don't have good news without the resurrection. The resurrection is the good news. They are 100% intertwined. Now, the first aspect of the resurrection is, is recordable. You see here it says that Christ preached that he has been raised from the dead. Verses 12 and 15, we have testified of God that he is raised from the dead. We know from history, for a fact, there have been numerous testimonies People willing to give their testimony to the point of death, brutal death for our Lord. Again, we have a God who has provided us with so much verifiable evidence. But here about this point, 
What is often missed about the resurrection is not the fact that we had eyewitnesses willing to die, but the fact that God sovereignly chose a point in history where this event will be recorded and relayed in an unimaginable way. From its mere beginnings in the nation of Israel, right? In less than two centuries, it was the predominant. I mean, you can do more research on that. I, I cannot anchor on this. But the timing of the crucifixion and resurrection of Christ is such a beautiful crossroads in our history. It demonstrates the sovereignty of our God at a magnificent level because we can definitively, 2,000 years later, 2,000 years later when they wrote on, on papyrus and leather, right? We can verify what happened. I mean, think about this. I mean, there is no document that is more trusted by any measure that you want to use in a secular sense than this New Testament, Old Testament document that you see before you. Do the research. Lee Strobel, uh, if you want to do some better research than what I'm giving you right here. This is a document that should be trusted because everything in it is true. Again, it's not something that can't be verified. The archaeology supports it, corroborates it. The events that occur, the history support it. It's there if we're willing to do the work. And it's such a magnificent testimony to our God by the fact that he planned the resurrection and the crucifixion to occur at a specific point in history that would be recorded for everyone moving forward. Now, the next fact that I want you to want to celebrate when you talk about it, it's verifiable. You see here, there's a couple conditional clauses that the Apostle Paul uses. If, then, if, then. Now, see, this is the terrifying part of life. Is that verification requires effort. Right? Y'all can all leave here today and just take everything I say at a 100% face value. Or you, you can go home and verify. You have to do the effort. See, that is the, the terrifying aspect of life. Is that every individual is given light, sufficient light to respond to, and every individual can choose to disregard it. And there's nothing you can do about it. And God will not force or coerce your love. But he's calling for you. He's begging you to verify what he has done. Test it. Go do the research and find out for yourself the fact that there's no other document that is trusted more than that book right there. Do your research. Don't believe me. Do the research. But see, yet too many people are too distracted by so many other things to give a hoot about God. And that's what's terrifying, right? We, will, we have those who will spend a life saying, you know what, I just don't, I just don't care. I just, it doesn't bother me. Now there's a final aspect about the resurrection that I want to talk about. We talked about it's recordable. We talked about it's verifiable. But the last thing about the resurrection is it's unbelievable. It's unbelievable. It's unbelievable that our God would choose grace. Before the foundation of the world and all the ways He could have restored humanity, He chose grace. He could have used any of these false systems of, of building your way, earning your way, but He chose grace. It's unbelievable that God Himself emptied Himself of His divine prerogatives, took upon Himself the mantle of humanity taken upon finiteness and fragility so that he could live a perfect life. So in that perfect life, he could die for us. It's unbelievable that he paid the price that we are unwilling to pay. Every one of us is capable of living a life without sin. Every single one of us 
freely chooses rebellion. Every one of us, we know this. I don't care what your doctrine on sin is, whether it came from Adam or, or whatever. The fact is, we all choose sin. And God came, He lived the perfect life, not to say, hey, look, it's easy, I can do it. But He did it so He could get nailed to a cross. Do you understand what crucifixion was? He got beat to within an inch of his life with lashes. He carried a cross till he couldn't carry it anymore. Then he had railroad spikes driven through his feet, driven through his hands to suffer one of the most agonizing forms of death that man has thought about, arguably speaking. And why? Why did he do it? He did it so he could have open arms telling everybody that I am here for you at all times. Please just come back. I will do anything if you will just come back to me. I don't need you to do anything but accept my blood. I have shed it. It's unbelievable that not only the crucifixion takes away our sin, but when he rose again, we are imputed with the righteousness of Christ. Have you thought about this? It's, we always focus on the forgiveness of sins, but we forget that when we rise again, he is the first fruits and we are joint hairs. It makes no sense. That is why when you think, I, I'm not ready for salvation, you don't understand grace. You can't be ready for salvation ever. You're never going to be more perfect because we are covered by the righteousness of Christ. It's unbelievable that the Holy Spirit comes and indwells us as believers so that we can funnel the fruits of the Spirit, so that we can become more Christ-like, but it's an earnest payment for the glory that we have that is waiting for us so that you can know for a fact that you have a day of glorification coming. You see, earnest payment is something you put down. If you're not familiar with the term, it's like if you're going to buy a home. So say you're here in Kootenai County, you know, you're going to go put $4,000 down on a $700,000 one studio bedroom apartment on a tenth of an acre. Right? Right? So that Holy Spirit is there for you to know that you are saved, you are going to glory, and it's to give you just a simple, minute taste of the glory to come. Just for you. And it's unbelievable that God the Father, He never stops granting mercy and love. Never. For those of you who have not accepted Christ, the prodigal son, the parable is so powerful because it pictures the Father waiting for his son who is out wasting his inheritance, his son who has disrespected him, his son who is out whoring, his son who is out doing the most reprehensible things, his father never stops waiting and looking and praying for him to return. My friend, until the day you die, God is waiting. He just wants you to turn back. He doesn't need you to do anything. He doesn't need you to fix anything. He just simply needs you to come back. He is waiting. Don't harden your heart. Don't be distracted. There's nothing more important than coming back to God. And for the believer, right? It doesn't stop. He doesn't stop giving us grace and mercy after we're saved, right? You know, I was at a wrestling tournament 14 hours yesterday. There were a couple of times that I was probably less than, uh, you know, less than my best self. But God is faithful. If we will confess our sins, He's faithful to forget our sins as far as the east is from the west. He never stops granting us mercy and grace. But the question of all this brothers and sisters, what are you going to do with it? What are you going to do with this information? If you are lost, if you have not accepted His grace, He's there. He's waiting. His will is that you come home and you accept His gift of grace. You're imputed with the righteousness of Christ. You are forever His. There's no principality, no power, no anything that can separate you from the love of God once you accept it. But He won't force it. And if you say, like the fool in the Psalms that says, no God, He will grant your wish. That is the terrifying part. So now as the band comes back up, to my believers... 
Obviously, this message is heavily focused upon the resurrection and the grace. But let us not relax, right? Paul was very clear in Hebrews when he gave the metaphor, we are running a race, right? We're not on a fun run, right? We're not on a walk and stroll. We are on a race. So how do we race as a believer? We start off by loving the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your soul, with all your strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. Then once you've done those, think about yourself. You say, well, I don't really understand that concept. Well, you start by seeking the kingdom of God first. In other words, prioritize God in your life. That doesn't mean you need to go to a commune. That doesn't mean you sell everything you have. It means prioritize connection with God above all else. And the thing about that is, it's not, it's a, and again, it's something that until you do it, experience it, you won't believe it, but it is a net positive. Tell me a wife in here that doesn't want her husband praying, that doesn't want her husband loving her like Christ loved the church. Tell me a wife who wants that. Show me a husband who doesn't want his wife praying, who wants his wife respecting him, as the Bible commands. Show me that person. You see, what we lose and what we allow the world to distort our thinking is that somehow putting God first is going to detract from the other things we do. No. By putting God first, it elevates and enriches everything else we do. Because now, I'm not just going to be a friend who tells you, hey, I'd love to have you over for dinner sometime, right? And not actually mean it, right? Yeah, from the South, you get that. Hey, when I am a friend and I am emboldened by the fruits of the Spirit, I am trying to connect to you. Tell me what you need, brother. Tell me where you're vulnerable. Tell me how I can help you. You see, when we put God first, it elevates and enriches everything in our life. Everything. You're not subtracting from your life when you put God first. You're making everything better, infinitely better. But the problem is obedience unlocks understanding. And until you obey, you will not understand. And I could yell as much as I want, and it's not going to have an impact unless you simply do. Why do you call me Lord if you do not do what I command? And today the command is we celebrate our risen Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. All right, let's get out there. Take a moment before we start singing with our wonderful band. Look around. Find somebody that you don't know, please. This is Resurrection Sunday. I want every visitor to be very nervous right now at this moment. I want every visitor sweating like I am sweating, thinking, man, how am I going to get out of these doors without being mauled? Not going to happen. Please. I joke about this, but it is so vital. If nothing else, we are a church of love. We are a church of joy. We are a church that will accept you as you are, as Christ does. If nothing else. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for this day. Thank you for the chance to just come and preach your word. Lord, we're so thankful for this land we live in, this beautiful day. Lord, I pray that our hearts just take this day to celebrate your victory. Lord, you have won the victory. There's nothing that can take it from you. And, and despite this downward spiral of society and the darkness that is coming upon us, we know that you have already secured the victory and we have an opportunity now to be the brightest light that we can ever be. I pray that you embolden our hearts, still our spine. Lord, so thank you for this church, and I just pray that, Lord, we connect. We make this day, this time of coming together meaningful. We don't just come here and listen and individually inspire ourselves, but we come here and we seek out ways to connect to others because it's about 
the body of Christ, Lord. It's not about us as individuals. Lord, just thank you for everyone willing to come and, and hear your truth, Lord. And I pray that you open the hearts and plant seeds. And, and Lord, you just work your ways and you open ears to your truth, Lord. All these things we do in Jesus Christ, love the name. Amen. Amen. Stand for the last song.